It's 1999 in Los Angeles. A beautiful woman in trouble and an incriminating roll of film send a photo lab worker on an investigation into a dark world of sex, secrets, and murder in Richard Kilroy's neo-noir thriller, Proof Sheet, on this episode of VFX for Indies. Hello and welcome to this episode of VFX for Indies, the podcast about the intersection of visual effects and independent filmmaking. I'm your host, Paul Denigris, VFX artist, filmmaker, and CEO of Foxtrot X-Ray, a boutique visual effects company. With me today are two of the filmmakers behind the neo-noir thriller Proof Sheet. We've got editor Keith Clark and writer-director Richard Kilroy. Welcome to the podcast, guys. Thank you. Hello, Paul. Thanks for having us. Thanks for being here. Yeah, I've been looking forward to talking about this film with uh, with you guys and uh, and sharing some of the uh, the journey that you went on to get the film made uh, with our audience. So why don't we just start with quick introductions? Tell us who you are and give us kind of like the uh, the Cliff's Notes, if you will, of your career. Okay, all right. Uh, Keith Clark, I'm an editor. I also am a filmmaker that does a lot of documentary stuff, a lot of behind the scenes documentaries on movies. That's kind of like my usual day gig. Uh, but I have crossed over into some narrative stuff as well. Uh, the most recent stuff that I've worked on uh, was The Empty Man, a Fox horror film that uh, you can find out there. Or I guess it's now technically a Disney Fox horror film. Um, I, that's actually how I met Richard. I knew the guy that direct, wrote and directed that is a guy named David Pryor. And we've been friends for about 20 years. And I know David and Richard were friends for much longer than that even. So I would always hear about Richard, but I somehow, over the 20 year period, we'd never actually met. <laughs> but uh, during the, right when the pandemic started up, my friend David had sent me an email just saying, hey, uh, do you know anybody that might be interested in cutting an indie feature? And I was like, yes, of course, I could, I'd be interested in that. And he connected me to Richard and yeah, we had a great conversation about it. That's funny and coincidental because a mutual friend named David also introduced me to Richard. That's right. That's Different right. David, David Stipes, yes. who my uh, viewers and listeners might remember from our Star Trek episode, our premiere episode a few weeks back. He introduced me to uh, to Richard, and uh, that's how we got involved with Proof Sheet. So, Richard, why don't you tell us about yourself and uh, and some of your career highlights? And I know your career is long and varied. Uh, keep in mind, we only have an hour, so let's really, give, give us the give us the short the short elevator speech, even if it's I guess a tall building with a long elevator ride. Nice. Well, I would have written you a shorter letter if I had more time. Um, right. Well I, well, I started out making short films. Uh, they all always had visual effects in them for some reason, and fantasy stories. And then I got into theater. I was directing theater. And then um, I've been peddling this script for a long time, this neo-noir. And uh, in the interim, I worked in a lot of visual effects. So I did Titanic. I did uh, Terminator 2, Rainbow 3, in the line, not in the line of fire, the other one, Clear and Present Danger. All right. Yeah. I forget what movies I worked on. So, but yeah, so I was a mad artist. I was a model builder, scenic artist, uh, blueprinter. You know, whatever this company that I worked for primarily would hand me, I ended up doing. So I was like, oh, today I'm a mad artist. Okay, fine. And it was all pretty much in the pre-digital sort of the Most of this was photochemical, yeah. 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 Old school. I, I love how humble you are, Richard. You're just like, yeah, I worked on, you know, Titanic. And <laughs> 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 you know, only a bunch of the, the highest grossing movies of all time, you know, on yeah. your resume. That's, right. that's fine. It's no big deal. The, nu the <laughs> nuclear blast sequence in Terminator 2? Yes, yeah, the nuclear yeah, nightmare. Yeah. It's, people have heard of that one or seen that, I think. Yeah, it's yeah. I've good. seen it once or twice. It's pretty good. Um, <laughs> a, lot of my, a lot of my contemporaries in the VFX uh, industry were inspired by uh, by those films and uh, yeah, and, yeah. You know, there's a lot of a lot of people a lot of people fanboy over uh, over the term particularly Terminator Two. Um, yeah, I'm a I'm a massive Cameron fan, so yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. that that he his his run of movies has been uh, incredibly impressive, uh, kind of a singular achievement. No, nobody else 
nobody else makes them like Jim Cameron. That's right. Yeah. We wish he would make uh, more, right? Yeah. And <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but hey, we're the beneficiaries in a lot of ways, right? A lot of the uh, the technology that he, that he forced to have developed yeah. on previous movies, uh, yeah. you know, we we now use as a little you know boutique shop running out of run essentially running out of my uh, you know another bedroom in my house, um, you know. So technology that was created for Avatar we used on your movie. Right. Nice, Which right? Is That's amazing. Wildly different, but uh, right. yeah, yeah, we sort of owe that to uh, to Cameron and his uh, and his team. So that's that's really uh, really kind of cool. It's um, the whole VFX industry is very um, tightly connected. You know, we all we all end up knowing each other. We all end yeah. up learning yeah. from each other, which is really really nice. No, when I started out as a matte painter, I always wanted to do that because of Star Wars, you know, and the Alan Shaw paintings and all that, and Yurisich. And I realized it dawned on me at that time when I was doing matte painting, there might be less than a hundred people on the planet who do this job. And now of course that's changed with the whole digital revolution. But at that time, traditional matte artists, we all knew who, who we were. Yeah. We had a little click. It must've been an incredible time, you know, because uh, in a lot of ways you guys were writing the rule book, you know, for what we do now. Right. Yeah. Um, a lot, a lot of the digital, even aside from the, the, you know, the avatars that create all this new di digital tech that kind of ripples downstream to, to these, you know, um, uh, indie shops and indie films and, and whatnot. But, you know, the concept of a matte painting, it's, you know, it's, just, it's still a term we use today, right? Yeah, a, yeah, a lot yeah. of the, um, the, te the terminology, a lot of the techniques they're happening in the computer. Now they're not happening in, happening in the analog world, but you guys were writing the, writing the book on, on how to do that during, uh, during that period. So, um, you yeah. know, the whole, uh, the whole industry is, is definitely indebted to, um, to that, yeah. those pioneers that really have been, have been doing it since, uh, since Star Wars. I was just going to say on the matte paintings, the interesting thing about, um, seeing that transition, cause we're all sort of of an age where we saw the, saw the effects really evolve between Star Wars and something like Avatar, obviously. It's a huge, right. huge different world. But the behind the scenes documentary stuff that I've done has interestingly, I've, I'm not a visual effects guy at all, but I love visual effects. And somehow I've managed to get this interesting education through all the behind the scenes stuff. I've worked on a lot of David Fincher's movies with David Pryor. So really got to sort of see how he did visual effects and visual, invisible visual effects I've sat in an edit room with Harrison Ellenshaw, mm. make editing a documentary about his father, Peter, and mm. basically the entire sort of early industry of, of matte paintings. And I've sat in an edit bay somehow for like an afternoon with Ray Harryhausen. That's amazing. Editing uh, a, a collection of his original short films that they released on DVD in the early 2000s. And they're all geniuses and you just, yeah. it's, it's amazing to see all that stuff. So that stuff's, even though it's gone and it's not how people are doing visual effects anymore, how they used to do it is every bit as valuable to know uh, and understand as it is how things are done now. Cause it all, it's the same thing, just different tools. I got to meet Linwood Dunn. Oh, nice. You know, uh, Mighty Joe Young and uh, West Side Story did the matte paintings for that. And he had a shop and he was oh, just wow. still, yeah, great. Yeah. So we, so so we have a lot of love for visual effects, which is funny because you, you then did not write a movie or direct no. a movie that was visual effects heavy at all. No, because I'm weird. I, I, I took my theater background and, you know, I, I love interpersonal relationships. And so that dialogue fascinates me. So I'm, I'm of five different minds, So, which is why I don't have any friends, I think. <laughs> right. Oh. I'm jo I'm I find that hard to believe. Thank you. <laughs> well, let's talk about proof sheet because you're right. It is it it is not a visual effects heavy movie. It's not what one would consider a VFX movie, but it's got 50 VFX shots in it to help tell the story. And it's and and that makes it a really good test case for uh, this podcast and the the mission of this podcast. Right? It's to it's to educate independent filmmakers about the VFX process. So yeah, the, these are filmmakers who aren't making Avatar, but they're making something much more like proof sheet. A few characters, very dialogue heavy, you know, very often in the crime genre. Um, and VFX can help them uh, 
helps smooth out some of the edges, right? Because indie filmmaking moves fast and we miss things or things aren't just aren't able to get done on our time, uh, on our schedule and on our budget. And so um, VFX, you know, comes into the rescue at the end. So g give us a quick, you know, synopsis of proof sheet and maybe um, tell us just a little bit about, you know, the inception of the project and how it how it came to be made. Yeah. Yeah. OK. You, you want me to try to help you with the synopsis? Yeah, because I go on and on. <laughs> well, I think yeah, your intro covered it, covered it great. Yeah. But, but I can tell you what what I loved, what the way I describe it or pitch it to people is it's a it's a throwback neo-noir I also call it a Latino giallo because uh, it sort of has some aspects of that. And it, the whole film is set very much in the sort of Latino culture of East Los Angeles with a predominantly Latino cast. And I thought that was all really interesting. And on the page, you never, you never read the script, right, Paul? We, you, by the time we met up with you, we had a cut. Yeah. I just want to interject one quick thing. Eduardo Santiago co-wrote it with me. So it's yeah. a co-write. But it was very, the thing that appealed to me about it was that it was very much a, a fun, very small, interesting throwback to a specific type of 90s thriller or 80s thriller. I, it reminded me a lot of, of uh, Blowout, the De Palma film, uh, but with a younger mm -hmm. protagonist and an interesting sort of thing. I love photography. The main character, you know, is a, is a photograph, photographer who works at a photo lab at a time right at the end of basically, right. you know, chemical film and paper film and film prints before digital had taken over. So all of that was pretty appealing to, to me of like, just thinking that's something I want to see on screen. My sister, the same like me, afraid. I am not able to leave the city without her. You helped me to find her. Thank you. But you have to meet me at the shop, 1240. Tomorrow. You say nothing, Angel. There's something just between us. Faith. Faith. Okay, so you tell me you lost a girl, right? She was supposed to meet me the next day, but never showed. A day later, these come in. There are people after her presented a huge challenge for these guys, which what was, you know, as an editor, I don't care about it because none of it affects me. I only get the footage when it's been shot, but the challenge of doing a low budget film set in 1999, I mean, that yeah, alone suicidal is it's not a, it's not an easy thing to do, suicidal. but they 35 did. location changes, 32 speaking parts. What was I thinking? I don't know. It's ambitious, but it, it, it paid <laughs> off and, and they shot it in a way that they weren't reliant on a lot of visual effects. Um, no. They, sh they, they shot it with a very stylized look, a lot of shallow depth of field. Uh, you know, they weren't locking up streets. They weren't locking up, you know, traffic. They weren't able to roll in a semi full of 1999 cars. Uh, so there was a lot of stuff that's sort of being avoided, cut around, out of focus. Mm -hmm. um, but it, we had it, to be very clever with that. Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, you, we have no control over uh, background. That was all we could control foreground only when we were outside in the wilds, you know, and so we could get period costumes, period cars to be right in the foreground. But after that, it's, you know, what is out there is out there. But luckily, you know, our DP, Jonathan Pope, he did a great job yeah. capturing all that. And it's, and it's a it's sort of a proof and a testament to the fact that story really is king and story and the performances yeah. are always going to be the most important thing. And if you're able to get that, right and get that good enough everything else can sort of fall into the background and, and just support that stuff and you can truthfully get away with a lot uh on very little money yeah we did a lot of cheats and I, at some point i would lo love for you to talk about the uh splits you did in oh. the editing yeah yeah because those were great saves on just timing of the performances yeah that's a that's a very typical practical thing with editing that every and it's just now getting to where indie filmmakers can do it i mean obviously we all sort of started hearing about split screen and intra frame editing i think it was when lucas was doing the prequels and george lucas and mm -hmm. he started toying around with splitting up the frame and yeah. manipulating the performances and on a vfx heavy film that makes a lot of sense and i know 
Fincher really got into it uh, with sort of the micro micro editing and changing things around. You have to be careful with it. Uh, we did a lot of it on the empty man, but on proof sheet, we had to, I had to be ju judicious with it because there's times where you can do a split screen and it's an optical effect or the modern equivalent of an optical effect that you would do in the DI. And it's not that hard for them to do. Your colorist can sort of just put them together. But if there's any sort of bouncing on one side, it gets to be problematic. And then all of a sudden you're kicking another shot to VFX. And we didn't have a lot of luxury of, oh, we can just throw another shot to VFX because their budget and some real mm -hmm. producing challenges on this, on this film, you know, we were, by the time we got, I mean, you know how it is, right? By the time you get to post shit rolls downhill and it all comes to a head in post. And all of a sudden there's not mm -hmm. money for a lot of things that you had originally planned to have more money for. And VFX was, but we, definitely we did do a, we did do a, uh, a handful of those uh, split screen yeah, shots that's right. that you're talking yeah. about. And and for yeah. the audience who maybe isn't aware of what uh, what Keith is talking about, the idea is, uh, and the example I always use is, let's say you have two actors in a shot and maybe they are, they work at different rhythms. Maybe actor A really nails nails the take and starts to really feel like the character and, and feel comfortable with what's going on at like take three. And actor B maybe right out of the gate, take one, they were dead on. Take two, they were dead on. By take three, they're starting to get stale. Well, now as the as the takes roll on, you've got one actor that's getting better and one actor that's starting to lose their energy. Well, how do you make that work within the same frame? Obviously, with in separate close-ups, you're picking the right takes and piecing them together. But when they're in the same frame, you end up either compromising one actor's performance or the other, or you chop the frame in half and you use actor a from the take where they're really great and actor B from the take where they're really great. And you put them together. If right. the camera's not moving, then as Keith says, it's something that the colorist can really, really do easily in what's called the digital intermediate or the DI mm -hmm. when the camera's moving, or even if it's just simple pan tilts, camera shake, then it's a matter of coming to VFX and we stabilize one side of the equation and then marry it to the camera movement in the other side. Right. Um, and sometimes it's even actors from the same take where you just want the response to happen faster, yeah. or maybe uh, a couple of times we did this on proof sheet uh, for continuity's sake, you had um, your young lead, he, where his eyes were when he looked up, when he looked down, got changed based on, how the rest of the edit around the, that frame was happening, right? And it, so that yeah. where his attention was and where his eyes were looking was actually being manipulated in the yeah. edit, and then sometimes within the within the frame. Um, so yeah, it's it's a common thing. We do it a, a lot yeah. nowadays, and I know it's, there's a lot more sh shots in a lot more films than the ones that we touch. I know there's a lot of right. this going on. Well, as a director, that's really a great new tool because that's something you, you used to have to live with it. You go, well, it's a two shot. I have to live with, you know, this one who's always giving five second pauses after every sentence they say, you know, it's just like a bad habit or something, or it's just a rhythm they fell into. Yeah. And now those things can be, you know, finessed. Yeah. We had some good split screens. I believe like the yeah. one I always think of is the conversation uh, with our main character, Angel and a, character named Bernadette outside the church yeah. on the street. We had to do right. some specific stuff there that was uh, tricky. for right. continuity of his arms and the way he was holding a backpack. We had right. just got gotten into some trouble during the shooting and it just didn't match. So we, yeah. we did splits. I think we did a little, what you call a little rock and rolling where the, <laughs> the right side of the frame is moving forward and then it's moving backward, but you can't tell to yeah, sort of right. make it last. But yeah, yeah, you do that stuff all the time and you can do it now fairly easily and fairly cheaply. Uh, and it does. It, it allows you to fine tune things and make your movie better without right. having to fall back on. You got to go into coverage and it's just close up, close up, close up. Right. Which isn't yeah. Stuff. But because as indies, we can't do a hundred takes like a, like right. a Fincher or, or Nolan until we get exactly what we want. Right. right. Um, sometimes you have to settle for three takes, but because we've got to move on, we've got to shoot 10 pages, 12 exactly. pages, 18 pages today. Oh, you, you were know, on our set. Amount. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> no, I wasn't on your set, but here's here's the thing. As I've mentioned before, when um, when David Stipes introduced us and uh, and Richard, you and your team 
uh, sent me the information about here's the film, here's what it is. And when I saw neo-noir thriller set in the late nineties, I went, Oh, this is my movie. This is, this is my jam. This is what I'm all about. I love film noir. Um, I, I, you know, like, I mean, if you look over my shoulder, I've got the the Maltese Falcon, I've got Deckard's gun from, from Blade Runner. Um, I made a noir almost a couple of years later than proof sheet is set 2001. I filmed a noir called the falls, which Mm. was about a young videographer who (laughs) fill in the blanks. He gets sucked into a web of sex secrets and murder. Right. (laughs) (laughs) So (laughs) my guy, David is his name in my film and angel are kindred spirits. Okay. uh, in, In a lot of ways. So, so when I, when I saw the cut of, proof sheet i went ah we have to do this movie i have to be oh, i have great. to be part of this this is noir is in my blood and anything i can do to make a help make a a a, a throwback neo-noir 90s neo-noir yeah i'm in you know what's so strange what's so strange is i did not set out to write a noir that was not top of mind it was just i wanted a story about photos and something in the photos if you look closer which i also sort of cribbed from blade runner when Decker goes into that photo, click, 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 click. Mm-hmm. Well, that was yeah. one of the inspirations for this. Yeah. And I just love the idea of it being a procedural. But then when I was done, I realized, oh, this is a classic noir. This is, I didn't, yeah. I think maybe that was the best thing because I didn't get precious about the genre. I just made it. Right. Yeah, but all the all of your experience and your love of oh, noir yeah. is, I mean, is I, built into your brain. Yeah, right? and I, I love stealing without myself knowing yeah. I'm stealing because that way I, sleep at night. So. What you were just mentioning, Paul, about sort of your your love for noirs and your enthusiasm, how it essentially prompted you to take the, the gig. I, I, I love hearing that. And I think that is, uh, it brings up a good point that people, indie filmmakers can be aware of is you want to, especially with visual effects in certain post heavy things like sound mixing in your DI, you want to make sure that you partner up with the right vendor, with the right artists with the right talents. And it's hard because as I mentioned before, you often find yourself financially strapped. Um, Right. But we knew we needed somebody good. We actually had started visual effects very early on in post Mm -hmm. with, with a friend of Richard's that I don't, he just wasn't a, he wasn't like a everyday visual effects artist. That wasn't his full-time gig. So he was maybe out of, out of sorts with it and it just wasn't going to work and the technical communication was immediately going to be an issue and we knew we we can't have that so we kind of had a list of things that we knew we needed we need someone that we know can execute the work at a high level and can do it on a tight schedule and And yeah that's when i I sent david stipes that hail mary pass i said you know i haven't talked to david in many years i said you know maybe he just knows somebody you know and my word was that the stroke of luck because i mean (laughs) the work is is terrific and and so th- as as a filmmaker, you've got to always sort of have your eyes open and always be paying attention to relationships, whether you're working on somebody else's film or whatever. When you when you meet a VFX vendor, VFX artist, and they're particularly good, if even if you're not making a project right now, you write that down. You b- get some type of relationship with that person because good talent is hard to find in every department especially at the yeah. sort of indie at the indie level well we pulled so many favors called in so many favors uh david yeah. Pryor did our opening title sequence it's wonderful yeah. and uh yeah. you know he did it gratis you know but it was one of those things that if you do a, an under million dollar movie on a 117 page script with all those changes of scenes and everything you have to find miracles and you have to find friendships and you know, basically exploit everybody, you know. <laughs> yeah. And if you're, if you're of a certain age and you've been in kicking around Los Angeles, doing it for doing stuff for a long time in whatever sort of movie studio adjacent projects that you're working on, you do, you meet people and <laughs> yeah. you, and you, you read and you're reciprocal. I mean, you know, when somebody yeah. needs something from me, I, I try to get back to, you know, I'm not a exactly. jerk about it. I hope. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So uh, I get what you're saying about uh, that. You weren't precious about the genre, which is great. But in a lot of ways, you still, I I think, because you you've absorbed uh, it's all more tropes. Yeah, it's all it's all kind of in your in your blood if you've you've consumed a lot of these movies. Yeah. So there's a bunch of really neat uh, visual. uh, I, I guess the easiest way to explain them is like 
optical manipulation, which mm. I think is part and parcel of the, you know, the noir genre. I think about things like, you know, the lady from Shanghai with mm -hmm. the funhouse mirror sequence, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You mentioned blow, blow up. Um, it, the, there's a number of, of these, motifs these visual motifs in classic noir and neo-noir broken mirrors um you know yeah. watching through glass watch, watching mm -hmm. through dirty windows you know right mm -hmm. all of this sort of stuff and you you guys leaned into that in a, yeah. a lot of ways i mean one of the earliest things we see is that really neat trick shot where the uh we're on the infinity symbol oh, yeah. on the lens and we pull back from that why don't you talk about you know sort of like i think there's kind of two two categories of the vfx that we did for proof sheet there's sort of the cleanup stuff which of, of yeah. which there wasn't a ton right you know it was like right. change out this sign you know change the, yeah. the the sign on the photo lab or um you know add the the sign for the the uh, the mother's makeover little makeover corner in the photo right. lab things right. like that those were pro more than likely were yeah. um were, they weren't big conceptual asks, right? right? And then there were some, like I'm talking about, like these optical effects, like again, looking, you know, looking through loops, uh, mm -hmm. photos being developed that were, they're part of the plot, right? Yeah. And they, I assume yeah. they were designed on the page, you know, kind of going into that. So why don't, why don't, we, why don't we just kind of focus on like what your process was in terms of writing and visualizing those special optical sequences? Well, I know when writing the script, uh, some effects were going to be employed. So it wasn't a total shock that, wow, we have some effects to think about. And it was always considered in our budget. And that's why we brought in somebody earlier on. But as, as he said, it didn't work out. But um, there's specific things. There's a dream scene where we kind of uh, see a cross dissolve into the crosshairs through a viewfinder of a camera. All of that I knew was going to have to be digital effects. And I should qualify one thing. Once I started directing the movie, I knew I was making a noir. It was just in the writing process. So then I did lean into it. Jonathan and I leaned into it. That was then we were like, let's have fun with this. You know, then we were thinking, you know, uh, Deep Red, Dario Argento, you know, who isn't really considered a noirist, but there are elements of that to it. Yeah. There's a lot of overlap, obviously, with noir and, and the Jallo stuff. Yeah, there is. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Amateur detective main character yeah and there's uh, dress to kill where you've got the the boy on the bike and right. he's got the you know all yeah. this stuff i absorbed watching all these movies over and over and so it shows like, up in your movie like you paul um the i didn't say yes to working on this movie because they showed up with a wheelbarrow full of money i'm a huge noir fan as, as well and i yeah. i read the script and it was all on the page it's it, it's a great type noir it really works it really Thank delivers and in, in that stuff that i like to see and i feel like People aren't doing a lot of that in movies lately, or not as much. Uh, it was so it was a good story to, to 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 do that way. The some of the visual trans transitions, yeah, were like the when he was just talking about the dream going into the dream sequence on the cross. While it was tricky for us to sort of fine tune it and get it exactly to a end result that he was happy with, that we were all happy with, that looked cool but didn't look too showy or too digital in some way, mm -hmm. whatever that means. Uh, right. That was some of the tricky stuff for like that sequence. Some of the other ones, like one interesting thing you, you probably aren't even aware of is there were other, there were two or three other sort of bigger transition sequences like that. And the whole, there's a sort of the climax of the film on the page, I think kind of had more of an effects treatment when Angel's yeah. looking at the proof sheet. There was just more of him looking at proof sheets and the images coming alive and us moving in, into them. And uh, we sort of figured out what we could in editorial for some of that. We simplified a lot of it, which is a smart thing to do. Mm -hmm. right. Always, when yeah. you're at that stage in post, you got to figure out does every, you know, what with every particular sequence, what do, what is the simplest way to do it that's going to del deliver the most bang for the buck? Um, and then there were certain we that allowed us to identify specific ones. It's like no, we know we need to do something. So like coming out of the dream sequence, that's where we do our big. The photo comes to life where you did that great push in. And I think that one we didn't, we kind of had roughed something together and tempt something together that was nothing at all 
what it became yeah. and yeah. you took that one on your own i think and kind of reinvented that shot in a way that i think it works beautifully yeah. was a v1 approval and yeah we, we got to do, like yes we got to do some fun stuff where we're pushing into the yeah into the proof sheet and the frame of round the you know frame within a frame right so you've got the the film frame the borders of the of the the negative if you will kind of like pushing past the camera as if we we've broken that fourth wall if you will right broken the membrane and gone back into the the moment that the photograph was taken and it, so it, it goes from being sort of 2d to almost to like feeling 3d and it, and the camera continues to move through it's yeah those were a lot of fun because um again so much of so much of noir is like what is real what isn't real what is your perception well that's the um, key word that's why perception yeah. that the whole movie is about perception yeah. right Right it, and executed right. in a in a subtle way though that it's not a showy visual effect that says hey here's the big cool visual right. effect it's still totally right. organic to, to the movie think of the tone of the movie and make sure that this isn't suddenly so outre that it yeah. stands out as a stunt you know it has to feel like it's the rest of the story and the world it exists in yeah right yeah I um. I, I remember when I saw the screening with you guys in, yeah. in Hollywood at Dances with Films, and I, ta I talked to someone after and said, oh, yeah, I did visual effects. And they were like, what visual effects? I had that same conversation. <laughs> yeah. Said, yep. yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. And that's great. Hey, I love yeah. that. Yeah. I love that because it because everything we were able to achieve everything uh, to your spec, to what you wanted. And it has that sort of this was made in 1999 kind of lo-fi yeah. feel not cheap lo-fi but yeah. but analog lo-fi is what i mean mm -hmm. right it feels yeah. like yeah. we everything happened in camera it doesn't feel yeah. you, you out we erased our thumbprints like we went in and did our thing and then erased our thumbprints and you shouldn't know we were there right, right if we've done our job right yeah exactly and, and that's i mean forget indie films on any film studio big budget films right. That's a hard thing. That's a hard target to hit is to have right. the the effects really be invisible uh, and, and not draw any attention to themselves when they shouldn't. Uh, it's, right. you know, not not everybody can pull that off, but we were very, very pleased and lucky to have teamed up with you for this. Well, thanks. I, you know, I, I, I'd love to take credit for it, but I really think that it comes the success of any visual effects effort really comes from the director. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of Richard was able to really communicate to us what he wanted. Uh, and, and you, Keith, were also able to really communicate like, OK, here's what we mocked up in the in the edit. This is what we're going for. This is the feel. Um, you know, you guys were really able to guide us. We, you, you weren't it wasn't a case of you dumped a raw, bunch of raw footage on us and said, figure it out. Right. <laughs> right. right. Not that I've ever had anybody do that, but some filmmakers they struggle with the ability to communicate specifically and i call them the right. uh you know yeah. i don't know what i want but i'll know it when i see it yes. crowd right which is a you nightmare guys weren't that you guys that's were, good thank you yeah. yeah you guys were never that um and so that's i think why we got good results and we got them quickly because of that communication i i also suspect that you know richard you were leaning pretty heavily on your own experience with vfx yeah. Right. So you were yeah. coming at it from the other from, from the client side instead of the vendor side this time. Right. So, you know, is there something that you can think of specifically that, um, you know, your you brought from your VFX experience into either our communication or just the design of a shot or something like that? Well, um, I know specifically when I, I did some visual effects art direction, too. So if I needed to, I could sit down and storyboard something and say, this is what I mean by this. If I wasn't getting it articulated with words. So that was a nice thing to be able to lean into. I didn't have to do it often on this, so it didn't come up, but it was always something that could give me a relaxation knowing I could, I could do that and that it would be appreciated. Um, but there are things that I said, I know, I know how we'll get this shot. We, we found a location that we needed a big sign for a psychic's reading room exterior, and we found the right house, but it, it had wording on their sign that I didn't want. And I didn't like the graphic for it. So I knew, I said, well, I'm doing a painting of that. And I just did a little two foot by two foot painting. I think it was smaller than that. One foot by one foot painting. Mm -hmm. And I knew that uh, as long as we, 
you know, put up a piece of green screen there. I, I, so we all had that stuff before we went to set. We didn't go, how are we going to solve this? You know, I said, well, that's, that's how we're going to be doing that. And why, so I've never asked you that, but in, in, for that particular shot, mm -hmm. what, what was the limitation that kept you, obviously time and money, I'm sure, but what kept you from doing that practically on set? And we had uh, 30 minutes. We were allowed there. Right. And so a lot uh, of your locations were it was a location. very late. We too. were, yeah. And that location we found the day before. Right. So there was a lot of everybody's uh, jumps in to try to find locations, you know, because, and I hated it when we had to shoot on a location we just found because there's, you know, now I'm, it's like, wait a minute, I have to be able to block this. I have to be able to think about, mm. you know, how I want to cover it now that we suddenly have this other background element I didn't expect. And, but you know that's the name of the way it was made. You know, it's just we're lucky that it cut together. Yeah, very lucky. Thank you, Keith. So, in, so, yeah, of course you're welcome. Signage is is one of those things. Yeah, for the indie for the indie filmmakers out there, it's like you got to you have to always be smart when you're in the chaos of being on yeah. set. It's very easy to say, uh, "Throw some green skin over there, and we'll solve this later." But yeah, no, if, that's a that's if you don't a have the, if you don't have the money, it's a terrible thing, and it's a recipe for right. getting things cut from the film. When, right when you can't afford to do it later right so you have to be strategic and smart about when you're gonna uh employ visual effects and for something like that signages that's a smart one one you know that the camera move is not particularly complex and signage is always pretty easy to throw up and look make it look realistic and make it look really good the other one that right. we, we went back and forth with you and i think on two or three versions for and we really dialed it into kind of what we thought was perfect was the sign above the uh the photoshop Right, which right. was that one was also it was a little trickier, right? Because it had a sort of a vertical tilt, right, with a little mm -hmm. bit of maybe parallax going on. But the uh, it was interesting to really work with you in between all, all of us, sort of figure out like version one, it was great, but there's just something that doesn't look real yet. And version two, yeah, we're trying to figure it out. And by version three, it was I think it ended up being just something about getting the right density of dirt onto the sign and making it look sort of worn. Yeah, I did. The, my one thing is right. I, I learned this in um, it's art direction. Uh, if you have yeah. an old building with five light bulb fixtures, well, they shouldn't all be fresh new bulbs, yeah. you know, so you get one that's maybe a 20 watt bulb, get one that's, you know, so it, it wouldn't, because that says there's a history in this room. You know, and so if you think along those lines, that's what I wanted for that sign. I said, it can't be blasted one solid bright white. It's going to be some of the neon that is going to be going out. You know, the uh, fluorescent tube tubing is going to be sputtering or something like that. Or it's just going to be dirty plexiglass. So and you guys got all that. Yeah, but it is. Yeah, that was, it, that was a case it was kind of uh, see, you'll know it when you see it. That was it yeah. took a few versions and and we all. Yeah, it Got took a, took a few versions because we were we were trying to assist in telling the story, right? Yeah. The shop is not doing well, right? Yeah. They're worried about their future. They're exactly. worried about it's the story. money. They're worried about how how little business they have. Yeah, it's, so it's part of the story that yeah, yeah. The 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 shop yeah. is a little threadbare. The sign is a little worn. They haven't cleaned it lately, you know. Um, and yeah. and part of my job as the post VFX supervisor is working with the artist and 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 getting him to buy into okay this is this is our part of telling the story right these are yeah, our right. lines quote unquote in the story right it's right. it's all this cumulative effect of these tiny little details um and it yeah. it, it really helps sell it uh w this movie has one of my favorite weird invisible shots that i've ever done mm. and that's the the, the tire blowout when, oh, yeah. when angel yeah. shoots the tire yeah uh and it was so i i we you guys had such a novel approach to it in terms of what you brought <laughs> to me to solve that I'm, and it was great yeah. and i I'm and good, good. It, it still surprised me that it worked out as well as it did what well, i was yeah. talking about we, we need okay. that and planning that we need to actually become like a our own little noir detective conversation right now because I'm curious myself to get to the bottom of this because I remember specifically sort of the back end of how that got figured out but when you guys were on set but what happens in the shot is a character shoots it's a very simple thing shoots a shoots the tire out of a van and the tire sort of explodes and deflates uh 
all within a sort of medium sized or slightly medium wide yeah. shot that shows three quarters mm -hmm. of a van, kind of a raking shot down the side of the van. Um, and when editorial, it wasn't very clear that this was going to be a, how we're going to do this as a VFX shot. I, I'm curious, did you guys shoot both? They shot two plates of it. They shot it one with the van in the my position. Idea, right. Just to, I said, well, we'll have it fully inflated. Then we'll have it deflated and we'll have to do some sort of blend between the two. Now, were you thinking that that was going to just be reference sort of material? No, I really thought, thought it was going to be work. a way to blend it. Yeah. <laughs> maybe my, maybe my ignorance about the post uh, process on that particular right. effect wasn't, you know. And when we had be. our first meeting with you, Paul, and we kind of went through and did sort of a VFX spotting where we went through and talked about each of the shots mm -hmm. that we, we needed to work. When we landed on that one, that was the one that I think you guys were the most sort of concerned about because it was going to yeah. be complicated, it was going to be tricky, and was going to, frankly, maybe the... I won't say the right way to do it, but the way a lot of people would choose to have done it was would be to uh, say, yeah, it's going to be a big 3D shot, and it's gonna you're going to have That's to what recreate was... this stuff and, right, right. and sort of stitch the, the two parts of the plate together. Well, I mean, we gave it both options. If one didn't work, you yeah. could have just gone from the right. wide where it's inflated and then do that with the 3D model. But am I right? Am I remembering it right that in that conversation we were having with you, we originally mm -hmm. started talking about it. I don't think I had the second plate in. I had the second plate that I was going to give you guys either for reference or for you to use to do something like a morph. But it was it came out of our conversation about how do we do this. And I think at some point you said, maybe we don't do it 3D. Maybe it's a 2D thing and we can mm -hmm. use part of the van from this and part of the van See, from that's, that. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. But, you know, I, I probably yeah. presume too much doing it that way. But right. And then I tempt it with, no, I did, it, it I did an avid temp with a morph, and then I it, sent that to you, and, do, yeah, and right. you were able to do a really good version of that. Yes. It's, it's yeah. Richard, your instincts were 100% correct. It, <laughs> it was, uh, and again, this is what I'm talking about, this this sort of lo-fi analog feel to it. Yeah. Because right? yeah. that might have been a, the one and only cgi shot actually there's another cgi shot we can talk about but um the you know sort of the one and only cgi effect uh in the movie right and do a do a cg tire and have it blow out all of that right. stuff and maybe even right. like replace the body of the van and you know photo map the the textures of the real van onto a onto geometry and all of that right. sort of stuff right. but it was like it, it's it's an occam's razor thing it's like let's try the simplest thing first Mm -hmm. Right. Let's yeah. see if that actually works. See, let's yeah. see if we can get something that that the director and the producers are happy with from the photographic material rather than starting to reinvent the wheel. And, you know, literally yeah. Um, yeah. pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, it it wasn't as simple as just morphing between two frames. It was, right, of course, yeah. um, you know, cutting pe the cutting the van body out of the second shot. Yeah. separating the tires, morphing from one tire to the other, doing some additional warping to create kind of like that, that bowing out yeah. um, of the tire so that as it deflated quickly, it kind of flattened on the bottom and spread out a little bit, yeah. adding in like the, the, uh, the torn rubber, a little chunk of, of rubber flying out, a, a visible spray of air. It's a whole bunch of little yeah. Uh, yeah. photographic things really. And, and pixel manipulation and no, no CGI as we, as we know it. Um, right. And so it, 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 it worked. And uh, this is a great example of um, you didn't need a VFX supervisor, Richard, because you, you are who you are, right? You understand right. how to do it. Another filmmaker might need a VFX supervisor on yeah, set sure. for something like sure. this to go, here's how we shoot it. Here's how we shoot it so that we have the materials to be able to pull this off. Yeah. Otherwise, it's going to be a big fi post fix. It becomes a that thing. isn't yeah. really going. Yeah, it becomes a whole thing, right? So yeah. yeah, it it was one of those things. At first glance, I went, "How do we do this?" But then breaking it down to its component parts and yeah. just focus focusing on I'm just going to deal with the tire. Let's just get the tire working yeah. right. Yeah. Okay, now let's figure out what the body is doing and how it we have to keyframe it to react to the tire and all of that. And then doing those little, the little burst just to draw the viewer's eye. They hear the gunshot, which we also did the digital muzzle flash yes, in the yeah. previous shot. They hear the gunshot. 
they see this little you know spark hit as it as the, like a fragment ricochets off the the running board right it's a whole bunch of smoke and mirrors to kind of like tell the viewer look here now look here now look here right. gun goes off hits the tire now the tire's flat and you get the you sort of guide the viewer's eye to make the story point so there is one shot where we did some CGI and it's uh, there's um, the apartment that Angel has been in the apartment and he's cracked the window earlier in the day and he's going to come back and sneak in through the bathroom window and mm-hmm. he's got to shimmy up the drain, the drain pipe. Right. Um, and yeah, I think you guys had put like a, a PVC pipe part yes. way up. Yeah. And then you decided you needed to move it and we needed to put a window. Yeah. Like we had to, essentially rework the whole shot to make it, to make the yeah. story point. Um, yeah. How did, how did that come about? Um, and, and, and kind of what went into planning that? We had a location set for that apartment building and then we lost the location. So suddenly my story point didn't make as much sense in this new location as it did in the older one. Cause the older one matched some of the geography of her apartment upstairs. And now suddenly we had a building with the window at the edge of the, building where it couldn't be. So it's an impossible room. So I had to split the difference and say, as long as there's some sort of architecture on the left side of frame that says the building goes on a little bit, the audience probably won't start doing, you know, schematics and say, oh, that could never be unless they, you know, uh, get bored and do that. I don't know. But uh, that's... That's what the need was. And I guess one good thing to remember when you're directing a movie that's going to end up having visual effects, give as many assets as you can to post-production. So that's why even if we weren't going to use the deflated tire, it's like, well, now you have reference for what the deflated tire will end up looking like on this particular van. So it's just giving you something more to work with. So it's like if we had the pipe, I wanted it to go higher than we needed it for the live action. So at least you get to see the trajectory of it. And, you know, so there was something just to try to massage that a little bit. So you're not just stuck with, you know, inventing everything from scratch. And they were smart when they shot it too. They, they even had a fallback for their fallback of, they, they did a a three POV tilt up to where the window would be. And as a safety, they also just did a lock off POV shot. And I Mm -hmm. think we talked about that with you of, it's like, if we, if we're asking too much, if we're not able to, to pull off the 3D effectively, we could always, you know, make this a 2D shot and just cut to the lock off and it'll be easier to get a window in there. But how for you, how was that as far as like dropping that stuff in? You say that was really the one shot that kind of had a substantial 3D component to it. Yeah, right? I would say that's that's te- really technically the only CG shot yeah. in the in the film. And if I am not mistaken, it was also a day for night, was it not? It was, it was yeah. right. It was, yeah, and we, yeah, had, to, was you know, we had to do some sky well, it was replacement. Actually, it was dusk when we shot that, but it was close. Yeah, enough. okay. It so was it was a, a lot du- of light. Yeah, but yeah, we, it was but, dusk for night, and it needed to be. Yeah, yeah it, it needed to be, to be much darker. Yeah. yeah, right, right, and uh, and we had to erase modern surveillance cameras yes. from the building. Right, add the window, the address. extend the pipe, move the pipe to a different spot. Yeah, so yeah. no, it's a lot. Yeah. That was actually pretty involved. That may be the only shot where. Um, very little of your actual photography is actually in that shot. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Where uh, every piece of it got manipulated. Um, but again, yeah. the, 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 the rule was make it look, make it fit, make it fit everything yeah. and, and, yeah. and make it bo- feel like it belongs in the scene. And we had your, we had nighttime photography of the, the other location that this was supposed to be. Right. We had we had that as a reference for color and for 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 lighting and all of that stuff. And you're right, reference really is everything. Um, yeah. The more reference, the more real world reference the, a filmmaker can provide to a v, VFX artist, the better the VFX will be. Mm-hmm. The the trap it it becomes very very easy to fall into the trap of oh I know what this looks like, mm-hmm. I I know what a muzzle yeah. flash looks like. I know what a gunshot looks like. And then you, your, your brain, every time you remember something, you modify it a little bit. You're not mm-hmm. actually remembering the thing. You're remembering your last time Memory. you remembered the thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. It's so, slippery. Um, yeah. Well, it's did- slippery. And so you, what you, 
what you think you know can actually change over time. And so it's always good to go back and, you know, wh- what does the tire look like when it's flat? Right. What does this kind of gun look like when it fires? You know, all right. those sorts of things. Yeah. We did, we did try to do interactive flashes of light whenever we said, you know, bang for the, because I didn't want to use guns with any kind of uh, firepower at all. Certainly not, not, no working guns. So. Right. Yeah. They, they, they had a, a couple different approaches for the gun stuff. A lot, several times it was simply pantomiming. Sometimes they had the light, uh, a light gag tied to the gun. And then at least one time it was like a gas powered, like a, something that brought the slide back for it did have a little uh, uh, action to it, but there was none of the, they they were all plugged, you know, and we did this whole thing with the first AD telling everybody a safety meeting and the armor and saying, you know, these do not fire, but we want to show you the mechanisms and everything. Yeah. Cause you know, that one disaster happened on rust, you know, and we're all very aware of mm-hmm. that. Yeah. And this, and this wasn't a movie that yeah. oh, frankly could afford an armorer anyway. So they, 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 all they showed up, fairly. but yeah, then they, they were off. Yeah. Um, the, the tricky thing with the light gags, I, uh, from an editorial standpoint, I really like those. Uh, the challenge for an indie film, I think, is uh, we get away with it in this film, but the timing is really, I think, hard to get mm-hmm. accurate to where it is. the gun's being fired. Yeah. You, if you put your sound effect in the right spot and everything, often the light flash is coming yeah, a little three late. frames later. Yeah. It's yeah. very hard to get a human being to... Two human beings. Well, it's like dominoes, and you know, all the dominoes don't fall at the same precise yeah. second. You got to wait for the, the lag, right. and that's what happens when you go bang, and the actor goes okay, and then the light guy goes okay. But all things are forgiven yeah. when uh, it's edited fast enough. Yeah, and the sound effects help right. a yeah. lot too. Right, and I and I seem to recall one of one of the shots. It might even be the one where Angel fires the the, the little revolver at the tire. Uh, mm-hmm. I seem to recall the the light gag may have been off by a few frames, and we mm-hmm. we um, added light when we added the muzzle flash. Nice, uh, nice we dude. added light. But again, we had the reference of what does it look like when yeah. this yeah. practical light gag goes off on frame? Let's yeah. make our digital light look like that, and then right. do what we can to mitigate the the effect right. of the practical light a couple of frames late. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, it's it's little things like that. Again, it's the you know the cumulative effect of all these details that uh, right that make a movie a movie, right? Yeah. Um, one of one of my other favorite things um, I mentioned my my noir that I made uh, called The Falls. There is a waterfall photograph in uh, in proof sheet. This is getting um, strange. That, was, <laughs> that I immediately immediately identified as Niagara Falls as it right, right? right. and yeah. there was uh there were a couple of shots where the the exposure on the photograph wasn't right or there was a glare and we ended up having to replace that photo yes yeah and i and i said to you i think i have that exact photo taken you did. right around right around the time that proof sheet is set <laughs> Right. Not that anybody's going to notice, but yes, I snuck in some stock photography that we had taken of Niagara Falls. I remember you from sa- my film, so saving us. A, well, you, there is one time where the effect absolutely saved the scene because the scene did not happen as I needed it to happen. And it, it was a, a, a misunderstanding between a department and they didn't know that I didn't want a photo of the waterfalls in a close up when he throws his photos in this trash can. He's giving up on the you know, his investigation, he goes, this, I'm, I'm giving up. But then he notices a little detail in a medium shot on, on in this photo. Mm-hmm. He sees it. And so if it's the whole photo is the clue, then that doesn't make him smart. He made yeah. the blow up. So why wouldn't he just see it when he made the blow up? So it has to be something inside the picture. And we didn't have that. And that kept me up staring at my ceiling fan at, you know, 6 a.m., you know, not sleeping. Yeah. And so it's a perfect solve. The, the story point is now in the movie where, where it wasn't before. And it required a couple of tricky com- composites to, yeah. to deal with. It wasn't just that scene where he throws the photo in the yeah. trash and then we actually do like a full on we go through Spielberg push <laughs> into this thing yeah. in the trash. But then there's the right. flash through the, the flashback. Of the bike. Yeah. 
Yeah, right. in the, and then the yeah. flashback, we need to see that photo hanging on the wall in a hallway amongst one or two other photos. Right. So you right. had to do that shot. That became an effect shot as well. It was yeah. it was it, something that came out of a story problem that purely was something didn't go right with shooting. No matter what we tried to do in editorial, we could never make it sort of. No, it, I, I knew sense. that that was never going to work because they, <laughs> it would make our main character look stupid. And if you've yeah. done that, you lose the audience. And I said, yeah. we can't have this. So. And there was no way to reshoot it. We had that location for exactly right. the time we had it, and that was it. So, yeah, it was a, it was definitely solved. Yeah, yeah. right. So, yeah, it was just a, it was a happy coincidence that like I could identify. Yeah. I'm, I'm like, I know exactly where that picture was taken. I know exact. I have that exact angle, and I t shot it. You know, either sometime in late 1999 or early 2000 when I was location scouting that movie. That's and amazing. so it's a nice little Easter egg from from me and like the two other people yeah. that would actually care. Uh, right. you know, from my, my crew that worked on that film with me. So awesome. yeah, it's, uh, I'm very, very happy that we snuck that in there. Yeah. Um, so any other, any other things that, um, you know, sort of surprised you about the VFX process on, on proof sheet? I, mean, I know you went into it eyes wide open. You knew what you were, what you were asking for. You knew what you were planning for. I, I, I would assume there weren't too many surprises, but then again, it's indie filmmaking. Surprises the big, are the rule of the day. The biggest surprise was you didn't tell me to go to hell so, because this was so <laughs> hard to get the, this <laughs> volume of quality shots for our budget and, and that they were all so just wonderful. And that that's where I said, he's going to, I think you and I had this conversation. Can we ask one more thing? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was always, like, how can we, anytime you heard from us about adding a shot or sometimes going beyond like a, version three or whatever, we would have to have a conversation first. And there were times that I think I probably said, I talked Rich. I think there was at least one time I told yeah, Richard, stop obsessing. No, yeah. we can't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, we've, we've, we've exhausted our goodwill, I think, and it probably wouldn't be a good idea or, or it's yeah. not going to, we're not going to gain enough from it. It's not worth it. Yeah. Better to keep sort of Paul and his team. Well, I had 10 other, other shots I, I thought we could try. And I said, no, there's no way. I'm not going to push my luck. Yeah. Well, that's, it. that's, yeah, every movie, yeah. right? It's yeah. like there's once you, more. once you, especially when you get into cleanup on a movie like this, it's like if you wanted to fixate on a movie like this, you could very easily go from our 52 VFX shots to 400 VFX shots. Oh, sure. If you just, yeah. you know, right. get rid of that car, get rid of that stop, stoplight that yeah. is not period accurate, get rid of these things, change that. Yeah. Yeah. But you don't need it. The truth is, you, do, you I, that's back to what I was saying earlier. You have to really be smart and judicious about what's required to tell the story. We'll prioritize and know that if your story, like you said earlier, if the characters are involving enough and the plot is f unfolding in a way that you're wrapped up in it, then some of these other fringy things can just fall to the wayside. And you go, well, okay, that's yeah. all right. We were going yeah. to originally and, re recall, a, a, do a callback to sort of the transition of the photos coming to life, sort of at the climax mm -hmm. of the movie. And at that point in editorial, this was before we were even working with you, it, because it was, that was one that wasn't really figured out on the page. We couldn't really figure it out so much in editorial. And I knew that we weren't going to have the money to really do a, a classy sort of, interesting VFX approach for what would amount to maybe four or five more shots there. And it became just a simple thing of, yeah, he's looking at this proof sheet and then you just on use a photo uh, shutter and a black, a yeah. black frame with a sound effect and boom, and now we're inside the photo and it's yeah. a freeze frame and then it comes to life and you're literally just doing yeah. a freeze frame footage rolls, it freezes on the, on the clicks and you're eliminating any need for VFX. Right. Cause I wrote this whole thing where we're traveling in and then it animates and travel back out and yeah. you know, and all this stuff, which, you know, it's easy to write this stuff, but you know, yeah. right. Right. And we had done that, that done trick a couple of times. And then yeah, there was also yeah. when he, he papers his walls with the photographs That's right. and yeah. sort of recreates the apartment yeah. in 3d space. And then she comes to life in the, in the photos, which yeah. is another one of my favorite shots. I, I love the way that one turned out. Yeah. That um, came well. yeah. yeah. But by then we've, we, you've sort of set up the visual language of this is how angel interacts with these photos. This is how his imagination is connecting the dots. Yeah. And then you can shorthand it as the film comes to its climax, you can shorthand it. And some of I, it just is, it's black and white, right? Like the film, like the, yeah. the, the proof sheet. And so it's understood. We're seeing kind of right. how he's extrapolating the action. 
right. from no, it's, what he's seeing on the proof sheet. And it, an and, and it doesn't need to be a gimmick at that point. Yeah, no, in fact, yeah. it was the best choice, really, because I had written the ending as a very operatic, you know, very drawn out, all the pieces are falling into place. Oh, you know, so I was really kind of milking that idea of moving in and out. But when you came up with that solve, I said, well, that, there you are. Because at this point, let's let's get the story finished. Yeah, you want to move in a straight line toward right. sort of climactic moments. Yeah. Everything we do in post ultimately has to serve the story, right? And sometimes that is throwing away a good idea mm -hmm. that's on the page that looks like it's a good idea, that seems like it should be a good idea, but it's throwing it away just to, again, like you said, take that straight line, get there quickly, make it an, an elegant solve and mm -hmm. let the story dictate, you know, when, when we do these, these bigger flourishes. Yeah. So true. So right. True. Cause you have to use film grammar. You don't want to do everything in italics or everything in bold face. You want to break it up. And so you go at that point, it needs to be fast. Yeah. And it's about feel it's, you're not having to hold the audience's hand for every little moment. You're just creating a feel. Sometimes you're, creating the illusion that they've seen something that they haven't seen. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's just through sound design and a particular type of cut or whatever. But yeah, mm -hmm. as far as the, um, what you were saying about what, what we learned or what I can say, I learned uh, about maybe a, a good way to look at how to deal with the VFX going forward is one. I mean, you don't always have to be organized. It helps. So you make sure you know what you're doing when you're shooting the stuff so that you're shooting the plates that you need and the textures that you need and the reference that you need. Uh, and in editorial, it's also kind of important to have either an editor or an assistant editor that's done some VFX work on other projects, bigger projects, whatever, and that they know what the pipeline is and they know what the workflow is yeah. because what is important with VFX is you have to really be organized from the editorial side. It's a whole other layer of complexity because now you're, it's not just editing the film. Now you're dealing with a shot that might have one, two, three, four different elements, different plates that are going to be combined. You have to be able to do, even if it's terrible, you have to be able to do a temp comp, a temp, some version of the shot. You can't just put a black slug in there with a thing that says tire deflates. You got to do something that helps you define the timing of the shot. Right. You get the sound design in, and then that's going to help you figure out what's happening in specific spots in the frame. But for us, you know, the, the other than organization, it's you. Ha it's impossible on indie films, but you have to have uh, you have to be able to budget the project in a way that you you don't get st or try to avoid getting stuck in posts where you've you've run into trouble. The first eight steps of the way, and the last two steps, you don't have any money left, and you can't solve anything. You can't get the sound mix that you need. You can't get the DI that you need. And we just got really lucky in that we found we didn't we weren't able to get what we had maybe initially thought we were going to a year before when before shooting had started and what we would have for post. But we got really lucky that when it came down to it and we had to really get creative and scrappy and start asking around mm -hmm. that we got lucky with the right people for all of those components of post. We got a, a a really good uh guy that did the DI, Jason, over at Pace Pictures did our DI and he did a great job for for very little <laughs> and, yeah. and obviously sound design worked out as well and our composer Callie yeah. you know she she came in at the last minute and had a very tough yeah. job of you know other than Oppenheimer this movie might have uh the most amount of music <laughs> under it yeah <laughs> but it's uh and she and she and she nailed it and yeah it's a, it's a very yeah. good score and kept the emotion yeah, the score and score is beautiful and yeah. worked with a temp that was very important to the images mm -hmm. and she was able to translate that in a way that um you know kept kept everybody happy and luckily i set up a tip jar so i can pay everybody so <laughs> right they all get their profit points i'm sure <laughs> yeah so i mentioned earlier that uh, i've seen the film at a festival Dan dances with films uh my my favorite festival yeah it's uh, great. in los angeles and, and one of my nice. one of my favorite in the world and um at, I thought the audience response was tremendous. It was yeah. wonderful to see the film on a big screen. Yeah. What else is happening as far as uh, festivals and and or distribution for proof sheet? Crickets. I think they're, on, they're <laughs> on the hunt is, is I think the no, only we, way we you are. can describe it. Like it's just it's else. such a process that uh, is new to me because I haven't tried to sell a feature film before. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are in the, 
we're, we're at the tail end of our festival run. We have another screening coming up on the 30th. Um, so that's at the NoHo uh, Cinefest. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's going to be a good venue too. So, you know, because the Chinese theater was a, a great experience with the sound and the picture being so amazing. And yeah. this movie was meant to be on a big screen. We shot it in, in scope and we were really hoping to get a, yeah. a nice theatrical, but, you know, we don't know where we are on that yet. But we had, we've had several offers you know, now it's just a matter of from distributors. So we're, now it's a matter of well, what's the best offer for us at this point. So we're we're still going weighing yeah. our options, I guess. It's it's a tough game for indie filmmakers, as I'm sure anybody watching that's finished a film and went down that path of what do we do with it and how do we get it out there. You're taking it to film festivals. You're taking it to sales agents. You're trying to basically get some interest, and you're trying to get offered a type of deal that makes it justifiable that you can accept it. And that's not so easy right. these days. It's a very, very different industry right now than it was even five mm -hmm. or 10 years ago for distribution. Um, there's on the one hand, there's a lot more uh, outlets with all the streaming and everything. There's a lot more places that your movie can end up, but sort of the value of movies has been decreased. So anybody that is looking to take your film, as far as uh, not to get too deep into the details, but if they're offering you a minimum guarantee, that's not the same amount of money that they were offering on the similar movie 10 years ago or five years ago. Right. So they have to be really judicious. And I think they're probably doing, they're doing the right thing, which is they're, they're playing a longer game and not taking the first sort of thing that comes their way. And let's, yeah. you know, you enter it into as many film festivals as frankly, you can afford to enter it into. Mm -hmm. And you hope that at some point, mm -hmm. It makes some connections. Somebody sees it that likes it, that mentions it to somebody else, and uh, the right sort of avenue will eventually show up. Yeah, we're we're under a tsunami of uh, not that we've done something brilliant. It's just you get a lot of offers. And Alejandro uh, Delgado, he's the uh, producer. He's been fielding all of this and keeping track of. Okay, this person wants to see the film. This person has seen the film. Now wants a phone call with us, and you know he's been very busy through this whole process. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's somebody else's problem at this point, right? <laughs> to figure it out. <laughs> I just want it to get seen. I don't want it to be, you know, the city's best kept secret. You know? Yeah. And it will, it will find its path. It's a, it's such a good movie. It w okay. will find its audience. It yeah. just may take time. And, uh, and your producer Alejandro is a go getter. Yes, uh, I have no doubt that he's going to find he's going to find the best possible scenario for you guys uh, and the movie will get out there. So yeah. that's proof sheet uh, online. You guys are proof sheet movie dot com. Correct. Proof sheet the movie. I think. Proof sheet the movie. I think it's I think proof, that's right. Proof sheet yeah. the movie. I believe yeah. so. We should, we should okay. know that, shouldn't we? Uh, <laughs> well, we I will make sure that it goes into the show notes correctly. All right. Um, Good so idea. And we have a face can, uh, yeah. can dial up your dial up your website. You're on Facebook. You're on Instagram. We're on Instagram. Um, yeah. That's the, yeah. pr probably the best way to to find uh, to find out about the film is mm -hmm. uh, is through social media. I'll yeah. make sure all of those links are in the show notes. Thank you uh, for this great. episode. Yeah, uh, and um, it, where is, do either of you have a social media presence or a website that you'd like to plug here that uh, people can check up on what you're doing next? Uh, I'm on Instagram. Keith Clark simulation is my handle there. I don't, I'm not too active on it. So yeah. the AI hasn't taken over yet on that, but, uh, <laughs> it's, it's all generally it's, you know, it's, it's all posting about whatever and maybe whatever particular project I'm working on as far as maybe the behind the scenes documentaries and, and uh, whatever the next gotcha. project, you know, as, as it is with NDAs, you're not allowed to really post on anything that you're, actually working on right, until right. a year or two later anyway. Right. But uh, so it's not a lot of real time action. Yeah. And Richard, you have an OnlyFans now, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm just, um, hmm. I, I'm taking the more subtle approach. That's what I'm doing. So, right. uh, yeah, I'm on Facebook, but that's, and I'm on Instagram, but I don't remember what the address is. So yeah. I'm not my own best agent at the moment. Right. They'll find you if they want to. <laughs> well, I'm Richard Kilroy, and look up, yeah, director, you'll find me. 
Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being part of this episode. I really enjoyed talking to you, Thank as you. always, about Proofsheet and about film in general. And uh, I, I hope I know that my audience will have gotten uh, some valuable insight from this conversation. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. We thank love the pod. podcast. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a service. It's great. Thank you uh, for my audience. If you're watching this on YouTube, please like subscribe, leave us a comment. Let us know what you liked about this episode. If you have com uh, comments or questions for these gentlemen or for me, or something that you want to see in a future episode, please share it with me on uh, YouTube. If you're listening to the show on iTunes or Spotify or one of the multitude of podcast aggregators out there, following us, leaving a star rating and a review, those are great ways that you can help the show grow and reach our audience. And more importantly, share this with the, the independent filmmaker in your life. They need to hear about this before they make VFX mistakes. For the VFX for Indie show and also for myself and everyone at Foxtrot X-Ray, thanks so much for tuning in and we'll see you next time.